Welcome everyone to the second presentation of the ARPS webinar series. My name is Nicole Willits and I'm a member of the ARPS executive and along with Drew Watson form the webinar subcommittee. Today we have Dr. Matthew Gannett presenting. Dr. Gannett is a senior physicist working in the ANSTO detection and imaging group. His main focus is on the research and development of novel, novel gamma ray imaging technologies and radiation detection for applications in the area of decommissioning and decontamination, nuclear security and safeguards and health physics. Previously, he worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the ANSTO Institute of Materials Engineering on the topic of plasma surface interactions of nuclear fusion materials, and he's completed a PhD in physics at the University of Sydney. Today, Matthew will be discussing the design and development of the Chorus 360 device, a novel gamma ray imaging system based on the theory of comp compressed sensing. He will take us on a journey from the fin uh, first stages as a simple MATLAB simulation through to prototype design iterations and finally launch as a commercial product. So today, um, as similar to our previous webinar, please submit any questions you have um, via the chat function. Um, and you can submit these questions throughout the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, we'll endeavor to have um, Matt address these. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Matthew um, for his presentation. Thank you. Hi, um, thanks uh, for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to uh, give a talk about uh, what we've been doing, what me and my group have been doing for the last few years. So I'm here to talk about um, Chorus 360, which is our uh, gamma ray imaging uh, system that uh, the, was, the idea was uh, conceived and uh, developed at, at ENSTO over the last um, uh, five or six years or so. Um, so um, I need to, there we go. So um, yeah, so um, I'm in the ANSTO detection and imaging group at ANSTO, which I'm sure most people are familiar with, but it's the, uh, the Australian government um, nuclear science um, uh, government laboratory. Um, we're located just about 30 kilometers Southwest of uh, the center of Sydney. And here's a aerial photograph of our site. So it's uh, relatively big. There's about 1200 people working here um, ANSTO also takes care of uh, the Australian synchrotron uh, down in Melbourne and the camper down um, uh, cyclotron. Uh, but of course, our most famous um, bit of infrastructure is the Opal reactor, which is used to make the radio uh, pharmaceuticals for uh, Australia and uh, Southeast Asia. And here's some, uh, some pretty pictures of the reactor. Um, so I'm in the, as I said, the ANSTO detection imaging group, where a group that um, does uh, a bunch of things. Uh, we do give advice to various government departments on radiation detection. We uh, Any interesting or novel application of uh, radiation detection, whether it be mounting it on a robot, putting it into weird spots, uh, in difficult environments to detect radiation in, where we like to be involved in that. Um, but the, the main thing that we've been working on over the last uh, five years or so has been the development of this um, uh, Chorus 360, the, the gamma, the gamma camera, which I'm going to talk about today. So let's start with uh, what is gamma imaging? Why is it hard, and why do we care? Well, so gamma rays are high energy photons, so that means they don't interact with things very easily, which is why you have really thick lead shielding to stop it. Usually, uh, as a result, it also isn't doesn't stop in a detector very easily. So you the high energy photons go straight through most things. So you need to have very large detectors often, and you need to have detectors made of uh, expensive and heavy elements to, to have enough electron density to stop the gamma rays and be able to detect them. Um, it's, it's not as simple as just your little silicon um, uh, pixelated array in your, in, the camera, uh, your, in your camera in your phone. So to create a pixelated detector to create an image out of gamma detectors that you need it needs to be quite a large array and it's quite expensive to create such a thing um and even then even if you do that you can't really focus gamma rays they don't if you try and bend them through a lens onto the pixelated array it doesn't work it goes straight through straight through the lens as well so you can't focus them without using some very exotic techniques and as a result, even if you do manage to achieve all of this, you have a very limited field of view. So it's quite, it's quite a difficult thing to do, which is why um, not everyone just has one. Um, 
sitting in the, in the cupboard of, uh, of, their, of their lab. Now, there are some ways you, you can achieve this. Um, uh, on the, the right here, I've got some of the traditional ways it's been done. On You can have a... You can do some raster scanning, so you, which is the uh, a single detector, and then that scans along your scene and takes in, takes measures the intensity at one spot, moves the angle it's pointing a little bit, then takes another one, and you have to scan your entire scene. So it's um, it's very you only need a single detector, but it's it's very slow. Um, you can have pixelated arrays of detectors, as I said, with multiple detectors. They're very fast. You have to use a pinhole or a coded aperture. Um, at the at the at the front, which is which is fine, but they have limited field of view and they're relatively expensive because you need a lot of detectors. And uh, the other main method, which is like sort of the 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 um uh, the other the most common way of doing it, I guess, is with a Compton camera, which um, is as basically two layers of detectors, and then you measure the angle at which the photon scatters from off one ray of the one level of the detectors to the second one and then you can reconstruct and work out uh, where it came from but um, due to the interaction um, of, of Compton scattering um, has a very it's very relatively inefficient uh, process and it also doesn't work for low energy photons at all anything below about 250 kV you can't you can't really image it doesn't it's not it's not efficient enough to um, to work um, so all of these uh, are good, but they all have their, their drawbacks. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so applications are, are um, there's lots of applications that you could use. There's national security, military and defense for people, you know, doing smuggling in radioactive things that they shouldn't be smuggling in. Uh, nuclear decommissioning uh, applications, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later on, nuclear operations, and of course, um, any uh, health physics applications, which I've got a few examples, uh, which I'll get to later on. So traditional, met this part here gets pretty technical. So if you uh, don't like that, just tune out for a few minutes or it'll get a, it'll get a little bit less heavy in the air <laughs> soon. So uh, traditional sampling methods for imaging, uh, I've got on the right here, raster scanning example. The blue is our source plane. Um, the red is the source. And you can scan along and eventually you'll hit the source and go bang that's where it is you have to scan the entire scene to get an image so all uh traditional image te techniques are based on shannon nyquist sampling theorem which is not exactly this but basically if you want to create an image with n pixels in it you have to take n measurements it's pretty uh straightforward you know the number of pixels in your image you have to take that many measurements whether you do that as a scanning method with raster scanning with a single detector looking at every pixel okay or you create a pixelated array and you take all the measurements simultaneously but you're taking n measurements for an n pixel image uh, which makes sense how else would you do it right but we um sort of um do a little sidestep around this approach by sampling in an interesting way and um, so we use compressed compress sensing, which is a relatively new sampling theory. It's only 10, 10 or 15 years old um, and uses a highly undersampled set of linear projections. Um, and basically what that means is that for an image with N pixels in it, for example, there's 256 pixels in your image, we can only take M measurements, where M is much, much less than N. So we only need to take a fraction of the number of measurements as the number of pixels um, in the scene. Now, so just sort of maybe intuitively understand what's going on there. It's kind of like a reverse compression, right? When you take a, a photo with a normal camera, you get an uncompressed photo and they, they actually really can be really large. So the one on the left is an example of 27 megabytes in size. And then you do some JPEG compression and you can reduce it, this example, 690 kilobytes in size. So much smaller. And you can't really tell the difference while looking at it. Like you have to really, really be looking for uh, compression artifacts to be able to tell the difference. So there's clearly something going on here, right? Where we can take, we take all of this data, we take 27 megabytes of data, we've thrown away 95% of the data, but the image still looks exactly the same. So wouldn't it be great instead of like, recording all of the data and then throwing away 95% of it, just record the parts of the data that's useful from the start. So that's what we do with compressed sensing. We're only, we're recording the image in the compressed format 
and then reconstructing it back into a, um, a high quality image. And so the way you do this in practice is it's this equation basically governs what's going on. You do um, on the right here, I have an example of a gamma image, some red pixels, which are, represent a, a, a hot source. Then you have a mask, which is made of something that attenuates radiation, made tungsten, lead, something like that. And, and then you have a single detector. And as the mask pattern changes, sometimes the radiation can get through to the detector, sometimes it can't. Um, sometimes it goes through multiple apertures. And, it's, uh, and so you can see the intensity that you're measuring on your detector goes up and down. So we can see the intensity we're measuring goes up and down. And by the knowledge of the mask pattern that we're changing, which is what we're in control of, we can then um, reconstruct uh, the image using um, this uh, minimization equation um, on the bottom left here and a uh, minimization algorithm. And the, uh, the important thing here is that important message of these slides, this part of this presentation is to say, using compressed sensing it's possible to accurately create an image containing N pixels with only M measurements where M is much less than N, often as low as 10%. So you only need to take 10% of the number of measurements of the number of pixels in your image to uh, to get your image, which makes um, get, getting your image a lot faster. And for when you're detecting radiation, which is often a very slow process because uh, the efficiency is not very high, uh, we really want to get that uh, as fast as possible. So that's the the theory behind the the device that we've been working on. Um, the timeline of this, this project, I guess it started in around 2013, where that was just kind of a, um, uh, an idea that, um, that, that we had, and it was just, um, oh, maybe this will work. Uh, so just tried it in MATLAB, do a bit of simulations. Okay, okay, yeah, well, this seems to really work. I don't see why it wouldn't. And then um, tell us the powers that be, oh, we have this idea, maybe we can give it a go. Can we have a bit of money to try and build a prototype? And so, well, what you need is uh, we have a detector, we have detectors lying around and then we needed to create some kind of mask pattern. So in the middle here in 2014, 2015, we created this thing, which is uh, basically a box with a steel plate, which uh, has a mask in the front. And so we put that in, take a measurement with the detector, manually lift out the steel uh, mask, put the other one in. So in the lab, we have a uh, 100 uh, steel plates, uh, which are very heavy by the time you've changed the 100th one to get your measurement. And it took uh, three, four hours to get a, to get a measurement. But, um, but yeah, we managed to prove that you can, this, this, this idea uh, works in reality with um, detecting radiation. And uh, then um, we, this is obviously not practical in any sense. It takes three hours and two people to moving steel plates to get an image. So um, the idea was to uh, have this automated somehow. And how can you do that? Well, the idea was to have a single detector and then surround it with the mask. And then the mask, a mask rotates so you get a new mask pattern every time. But it's not enough just to have a single mask. You don't get enough mask patterns. So it's actually two masks that are embedded around each other. You can see in this um, yellow one in the middle of the screen here. Uh, and then they rotate around. And then, so what happens is the, the masks rotate in a specific uh, pattern. The detector in the center records the intensity. And then we know what the mask pattern looks like. We know the intensity, we can reconstruct the image. So this one in the middle is a very um, uh, sort of a prototype um, homemade job. There's a, so this, that's actually 3D printed plastic uh, with little tiny bits of lead that were uh, glued on or screwed in, sorry, uh, uh, onto the, onto the, um, onto the mask very painfully and slowly doing that. Um, and then there was rotated, um, I think by hand, um, in the first case, but, uh, then we, yeah, prove that worked. And then the, the more success you have, the more people get interested in, uh, in helping you out. And then, uh, we had a bit of success with, with getting that to work. And so we managed with, in around uh, 2017, 2018, we really started getting some um, uh, fully automated systems, which uh, an example of one of them is uh, on that tripod stand there, which has a 3D printed case, but on the inside, we actually um, had a little um, 
uh, Arduino, which controlled two motors, which spun the cameras around the motors around manually. And then you might not be able to see it, but there's tiny little black dots on the outside of the case. And they have, so that's when we had um, four optical cameras, which take a, uh, an optical photo of your scene. So you can see where your radiation is exactly. And we had, um, we upgraded our masks as well. We found a place that does um, 3D printing in tungsten. So we 3D printed the, the whole masks out of, out of tungsten. Um, and so that was our sort of photo advanced, advanced prototype. Uh, we deployed that uh, lots of places around Ansto and um, uh, around Australia, various places around Australia. And also uh, we took it to the US um, and uh, Europe uh, to test various locations there. And um, all in the meantime, uh, trying to build, uh, walk towards a, a commercial product. You can't, you can't really uh, sell someone something that's uh, three, you know, three D printed and running it off an Arduino uh, through a MATLAB script. So um, over the last uh, couple of years, we've been um, really uh, polishing the device to be uh, a commercial product and be very reliable and um, uh, re reproducible um, in terms of manufacturing. So that's sort of the research and development timeline. It's taken about seven years, but really the first three years were kind of just someone working in the, in the background and then things really took off in the last five years or so. And uh, the team's grown from about uh, two or three people working on it part-time to about eight people more or less uh, working on it full-time. So um, I've got these nice animations here, which uh, show how the system works. This is, a, this is the photo of, um, of uh, our, our final commercial product, which looks uh, very uh, stylish compared to our original prototypes. So under the case, we have a series of masks, as I said, that um, uh, dual nested masks, and right in the center, a detector. The detector can be any type of detector, really. Um, there's nothing stopping you placing, replacing it with a different type of detector that will sort, sort whatever your purpose is. Um, so that goes in the middle around two masks. They rotate around creating different mask patterns. As the source is visible to the detector, the count rate goes up and down, and then you can locate the position uh, very quickly. Um, and here's an example of the kind of thing it can do. It, does a, it has a 360 degree field of view, so it can image an entire uh, room an entire scene outdoor scenario in, in one go um so for example you could place it between two trucks that have barrels of cesium in it and be able to locate uh which barrels um where where the where the source is coming from so uh, i'll just go through some of the properties i guess of the camera which make it interesting and unique so as i said it's a very fast image acquisition um this is uh, an example um, of um, some uh, fuel. Um, and there's an americium 241 unshielded at the, at the base. And this was uh, detected and imaged in um, three minutes um, from the um, same set of data. We can um, image the uh, plutonium rods as well and get the shape of those and, and their location in, um, also in also in about three and a half minutes. The other thing, I'll go into this a bit more later on, but we're actually, the detector we are using in our design is a CLLBC detector, which um, can also detect thermal neutrons. Um, so you can see in this uh, spectrum at the bottom here, you have this giant peak at 3.1 MeV, which is not a 3.1 MeV gamma. That's actually um, a reaction in, in the detector, which indicates the presence of neutrons. So you can use it to, um, locate neutrons as well, if they're in your scene, which is uh, handy for um, national security type applications. The other thing, um, we're using a spectroscopic detector. I probably didn't mention that, right? But they, we've got a, a spectroscopic detector in the middle. And so we can actually take an image over the full energy range. We're not limited in any, any way to what we can uh, energy range we can do. So the detector we're using at the moment, we've got it set up to go 40 kV to 3 MeV, which basically covers all your gamma rays, which are of interest, right? There's obviously higher energy gamma rays, which are uh, neutron um, created stuff. And, but all the, all your uh, everyday gamma rays are in that range. So we can 
and it works over the full uh, 360 degree field of view. So here, uh, this is a photo of our, our lab at Ensto where we set up three sources in these black boxes. Um, these uh, images can be a little bit tricky to interpret when you first see them, but this is actually a 360 degree panorama. So the left of the screen, left of the image lines up exactly with the right of the image. So we're looking at the entire room right now. So I've got an americium-241, a low energy source, a cesium-137, which is mid-energy 662, and uh, a thorium source. So we can look at the 2.6 MeV peak of that. And so the spectrum we get of acquiring is this, it's you know relatively complicated. There's lots of peaks going on from different sources. And then all we need to do is select the energy of the spectrum that we wanna look at and it will tell you the location of that source. So here you can see we've selected the 59 kV peak and uh, the americium hotspot showing up in the image in the sort of bottom right. If I pick the cesium energy, the location of the cesium source shows up. And if I pick the 2.6 kV, uh, MeV, 2.6 MeV peak, uh, it shows me the location of the, um, the, uh, the thorium. Uh, so, the, we, so you can image a wide energy range from a single um, spectrum. You don't need to take multiple images if, to get different, all the different sources that are in the scene. You can get them all in one go. And so this all takes um, a few minutes um, in this case. Yeah, so I was talking about the detector type we have. It's a CLLDC detector, um, which has a pr pretty good uh, energy resolution. It's a scintillator, so it's not as good as a CZT detector or a HPG detector. Um, but most cases, you don't need that. That's only specialized sort of um, applications. You may need uh, really high resolution. Uh, but it's definitely enough to be able to do spectroscopy and see um, re resolve um, what radionuclides are in your, in your scene. And currently we're using two detector geometries of different sizes, which are interchangeable uh, in, the, in the camera. Um, we're using a, a half inch cubic detector and a one and a half inch cylindrical detector. We normally use the large one most of the time because it's faster, you get higher account rates, but we, you can put the smaller one in if you're operating in really high dose rates because you, um, you won't overload the detector. We, you won't, dead time won't be too high with the, with the smaller detector. And also your image resolution is slightly better with the small detector. So uh, both of those come with the camera so you can just you, you put them in as required for different um, scenarios. And, and as I said, you get earlier, you get this 3.1 MeV thermal neutron peak from uh, produced by a nuclear reaction with the uh, lithium, which is inside the detector. The neutron interacts with that and then creates an alpha, which is then detected inside the detector. And it comes up as an equivalent of 3.1 MeV on your, um, in your gamma spectrum. So, um, so it's quite powerful to be able to recognize that there's neutrons um, nearby. Uh, yeah, and so as I said, you can as a plug and play detector platform, so we can change the detector with the same system for different applications, um, for different dose rates. If you want different um, um, uh, if you want a different dose rates or different resolutions, for we can put different types of detectors in there uh, or different price points. I guess uh, at the moment we're experimenting with doing HPG imaging, so high resolution detector imaging in there and um, also trying to uh, image neutrons as well, which we've had some success with. Um, uh, but that's for later in the, um, on the roadmap of development. Uh, and here's a nice photo showing how easy it is to change the detector. So how do we actually do it in practice? Well, you set up your system on a tripod um, and you, it's, uh, you have to plug it into the power um, and also it connects to the laptop via uh, Ethernet, um, just a single Ethernet cable. And then we have uh, this custom software which controls uh, this, the device and also um, analyzes the data for you. It'll do um, lots of things uh, for you, be able to create gen automatically generated reports, automatically identify your scene, automatically tell you the quality of your image. So it's very simple. You, there's only a few buttons. You turn it on, you press the take new picture image uh, into some information about where you are, who you are, what you're doing. Leave it all blank if you can't be bothered, um, just so you know what you're looking at later on. And then uh, this is the screen, what it looks like. Uh, 
you'll get your spectrum down the bottom uh, in the center. Uh, so spectrum information on the left, so the, not how long you've been measuring, dead time, count rates, things like that. Um, but you don't really need to look at that if you don't want to. Um, and on the right here, we have our list of regions of interest on the spectrum. Now, most of these will be automatically added. We have uh, re automatic radionuclide identification software built in. So it'll run for a, a minute, a uh, few minutes, maybe less, depending on the scene that you're in. Uh, and it'll automatic, these ones here are automatically added. So you can see we've automatically added the americium, the cesium, and the thorium. Um, as identified in potassium, which is uh, always there. Uh, and then uh, you just click on these um, regions of interest at the bottom here, and then that'll um, automatically show you um, the location of those of those sources uh, in your scene. And then uh, it's not populated in this screen, but there's a quality um, indicator as well, dependent showing you, telling you if this image is It'll tell you whether you can trust this image or or not, because um, sometimes you can get um, if you have bad data, you're not going to get a, a good result, and it can detect that. So uh, now I'll just show some examples of places we've deployed this and applications and uh, outcomes that have come from using this. Um, just a couple. Um, so this is um, an example uh, from Ansto, uh, which solved the real life problem that they were having. Um, there was a construction area, they're building a new building uh, and construction workers are not radiation workers. So we had to do surveys to make sure the site that they were working on had uh, the correct dose rate uh, for limits for them to be working. Uh, and they did, the health physics team did a survey of the area and found out, no, the dose rate is too high where it is, uh, which is not too surprising because it's next to this building here. Um, which is housing uh, lots of barrels of radioactive material. Um, so we set up the camera on the outside of the building to try and identify the main source of the radiation that was causing the problem for the preventing the construction of the building. And we're able to say, yes, it's coming exactly from this point in the building. Um, and it's uranium ore, in case you're wondering, because we can automatically identify uh, the radio nuclear. And then we set up inside the building and, and that's the image at the bottom and we can identify the same barrel. And so we're able to say, yes, that's the barrel that's causing the problem, remove that barrel and then redo the survey, um, which uh, saves someone going around and checking every one of those barrels to find out where the, the main source of the, the radiation was coming from, uh, which, which helps speed up the uh, initiation of the construction of that, that building. This is a, another example um, at Ansto um, in one of our hot cells in the um, radio pharmaceutical production facility. Um, they, there's regular cleaning of the hot cells um, and it involves someone cleaning it. Um, and so they have, they get a certain dose when they do that, but obviously we want to minimize the dose that the person going in there um, gets. And so we, uh, this image is even harder to visualize, but this is image. This we actually mounted the camera sideways and hung it from the roof. So you're looking top down into the top of the hot cell, and the aim was to identify, localize where the parts of the hot cell needed to be cleaned. So they could be uh, focused on first, uh, rather than just going in there blind, and um, uh, so we could reduce the uh, the worker dose um, um, for for that for that particular particular task. Yeah, and so we were identified, maybe able to identify two two hotspots, um, which were, were targeted first. Um, this is an example inside um, the um, molybdenum production facility, the, the old one at Ansto, um, where they were getting elevated dose rates out the back. And so we set up the, the camera and we, over the, the course of the production process, we were able to see where the main um, source of the radiation was coming from. So we set this up for a couple of hours and measured continuously, and then we're able to do a sort of time-lapse photog uh, photography of the gamma source as it as the production process moved through the um, uh, through the facility, we could see that it was coming through these um, mechanical feed throughs uh, at the mostly at the top of the of the hot cells there. 
And um, I like to include this image because it just looks really cool. This is where we just set up in a storage facility where it has uh, a lot of thorium. And uh, yes, we can see that these barrels we do have thorium with them are glowing, glowing red because they have lots of thorium. Um, so, um, so that's the sort of technical part of the system. Um, as um, the other part is, of course, um, of making a product is uh, marketing, which is uh, um, an in interesting uh, thing to undertake. But we have a we have a really nice website now and these nice photos uh, of uh, of the system. Uh, we're brand name, everything's registered and patented. And yeah, there's a lot of work to be done um, just on that end. Once you've got a good idea, that's certainly not enough. Once you have a prototype, that's you're not you're nowhere near finished. There's a lot of work to do. There's just non-technical non stuff when it comes to um, um, building a product. You have to do a lot of testing and compliance stuff as well to be able to, to, be able to sell it. So there's a lot, lot done to do with that. Now, um, now I just, uh, how much time do I have? Can Am I allowed, how much longer am I allowed to talk for? Can someone tell me? You can, ha you can have another five minutes. Five, five minutes. Okay, I'll rush through this then. Um, so that's talking about the Chorus 360 portable device. Um, but we actually made a completely custom device to image the uh, HiFi reactor so, um, uh, using the same technology. So HiFi is Australia's first reactor. Um, it was superseded by Opal, which um, uh, and it was shut down in, in 2007. And uh, all the fuel has been removed, but it's still high radioactive environment inside the, the tank, the reactor tank. And that's uh, it's, it needs to be decommissioned. What they're wanting to decommission it. Uh, so there's a, it's a very high dose rate environment inside the tank. It's um, the reactor tank, 10 sieverts per hour, which um, I think everyone knows is a lot. Um, so uh, we wanted to do gamma imaging inside that. Uh, and um, so we created this uh, custom device, which looks very different, but also is very similar to the, the one I just described, the Chorus 360. Um, so this one has a single detector and it's surrounded by two masks and they rotate around and create a pattern. But um, these masks are hemispherical. So we managed to do hemisphere hemispherical imaging. Uh, we used a half a cubic millimeter, because not a typo, the world's tiniest detector in order to deal with the um, high dose rates. Um, in the in the in the in the reactor chamber. So this is the uh, the thing we built. Uh, it's a basically a deconstructed Chorus 360, uh, which you can go down through the access ports at the top and image the inside of the reactor. So here's a little cool video of us lowering it into the the reactor tank. Get down the bottom, and then we take a uh, a hemispherical image. This is the inside of the reactor. So this camera is sitting in 10, 10 sieverts an hour. And then uh, we managed to uh, locate where the main source of the radiation was coming from. So we were able to identify the, the two pipes, um, which were the, 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 hot, the culprits, the biggest culprits, and also identify the other um, smaller pipes, um, which were giving off less of a dose. But basically the point of this project was to be able to say, yes, these are the pipes which are causing most of the dose, deal with those first, rather than treating the entire thing as high, highly radioactive. So that way we can potentially re reduce the cost of uh, the, the decommissioning cost by having a targeted approach to dismantling and um, decommissioning um, the reactor. So um, we were actually able to calibrate this detector using a five terabacker or cobalt source that we have at Ansto. And so we could um, uh, correlate the dose rate with the counts per second in our detector. So we know that we know the count rate of our from our image, convert it to dose rate, and then by knowing we know the geometry of the reactor, so we're able to give them an estimate, the decommissioning team an estimate of the activity of each of the pipes, which is what the kind of information the decommissioning team um, need uh, to make make decisions about um, moving forward with uh, decommissioning. So that's a uh, very quick five minute summary of something that took a lot longer than that. Uh, there was about a probably a 18 month project to do that. But uh, as far as we know, that's the first time anyone's done a uh, gamma image inside of a, a reactor, um, which is um, uh, pretty, we, we think it's pretty cool. Um, 
So uh, yeah, so what's next for us? I guess at the we launched the camera, the portable camera Chorus 360 uh, late last year. And we're looking at doing a gamma neutron dual camera. Uh, as I said, the detector can detect neutrons and where we can do um, uh, neutron imaging. Um, we're looking to do that this year. And then moving forward, hopefully uh, we'll move into high resolution imaging with uh, using HPGs and um, other types of radiation imaging um, in the uh, midterm to distant future. So that's uh, what we'll, that's our path forward. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I'm on to my supplementary slides. So uh, we can, I guess we can leave it there. And um, thanks to everyone for uh, listening and happy to take any questions. Excellent, thanks for that, Matt. Um, I just have a quick question before I jump into um, questions from the floor. So with that delightful pretty that you showed of the thorium, is there a way that you can threshold out um, different energy levels or and or dose rates so you can target um, like a higher specific dose rate area? Um, Does that make sense? Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. Uh, the answer is, no, you can thresh out all our energies, right? So you can pick whatever energy part of the spectrum uh, you want, um, which is which is fine. Um, the way it works, as with any type of um, doing imaging, is the brightest thing on your screen is the thing that dominates your image. You can think of it as when you, um, if you try and take a photo of a person, but you accidentally leave the sun in the background, uh, all you can see is the sun. And, um, so you get these dynamic range issues. So basically you're always going to see the brightest thing um, most prominently. And there's, uh, there's not really much you can do about that within in any type of imaging, uh, except that you can take another image. You can take your image and go, oh, that's where the hottest spot is. Set up some kind of shielding to block that part of the image and then go again, take another image. And that's a, that's a way you could potentially threshold out different dose rates coming in. Um, but they can't, you can't just do it by itself. That would require some planning when you're doing your imaging. Yeah, so I think that might tie into this question that was submitted was how do you deal with background and what is the typical yeah. count time? Yes. Oh, yeah, I didn't mention that. So, okay, so the background. Um, so because, uh, because we're imaging at 360 degrees, there's no background in that. It's the image, everything's in the image, right? And so the only, uh, it's a cylindrical mask. So the only, there's the top and the bottom, which are exposed to the sky and the ground, right? Um, but the underneath, uh, there's a lot of, you know, motors, casing, shielding, stuff like that. So we're actually blocking quite a lot of the background coming from underneath, um, from the ground. And um, we and we have uh, you know aluminium lids on the top, which you know, stop too much of the of the of the the background from the sky. But um, the background is quite low. In it depends on your scenario, right? If you've got a decent strength source, then that's going to drown out anything from the background. So it's um it's not it's not really from the top and the bottom, which was not really required. Other than that, you're Im you're actually imaging the entire uh, room. So. Um, the background is just actually part of your image and off, yeah. And and, nor, and the background for gammas, uh, the background is normally very uh, concentrated at low energies um, from um, the stuff from space. And then you've got backgrounds from um, uh, potassium uh, and thorium from the ground and just from everywhere. And um, yeah, and so you threshold out the energy. So you pick part of the energy spectrum that you want to image uh, and ignore the, the, uh, the potassium peak, um, unless you're trying to image potassium, which is very difficult. Uh, so the other part of the question was the count time, uh, which is always a tricky one because uh, with anything with radiation detection, the, how long you have to measure for it depends on how hot the thing you're measuring is. So if it's a high intensity source, it's really fast, right? Um, but if it's a, a low intensity source, it can take a long time. And we've, we've done both, um, but as just put some numbers to it, um, uh, our sources in the lab, we set them up for test, just for the small lab sources. Uh, uh, and we get dose rates at the, at the detector of about uh, a few microsieverts an hour. So only a few times background, five, 10 times background or something. Um, and we can get an image in under two minutes in most, in all cases um, for, for that dose rate. So low dose rates, even relatively low dose rates, you can, it takes a few minutes. 
we have done sub background imaging for really, really low dose rates and left it running for hours and you can get an image that way as well. So um, yeah, but typically five minutes, let's say <laughs> imaging time. Okay. Um, someone's just put in, look, looks like it would be very useful for nuclear medicine or pet production. Did you do any um, measurements in the cyclotron? Uh, no, we haven't, we haven't yet. Um, no, just to see, obviously, you'd be getting quite a variety of um, spectra coming out, especially that'd be good in terms of maintenance, ongoing maintenance for cyclotrons and things like that. Yeah, that's some that's a place we should uh, visit because it's, you know, not far from where we are. But yeah, no, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. That's but we awesome. are, we're, we're looking to go to the synchrotron soon, okay. um, which is obviously a completely different facility. But uh, yeah, same, same, <laughs> we're, we're different. always interested yeah. in uh, testing it out and giving demonstrations in different scenarios. So if anyone's... Um, interested in that, you can get in contact. Um, also, there's a question. Do you have different masks to provide different angular resolutions? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, uh, so when you're designing things, you have ultimate control and you have to make a decision at some point. And so we, it's a, <clears throat> when you have angular resolution, it's always a trade-off between angular resolution um, and um, count rate. Um, and so, and so time to get an image um if you have so the, the, we our current masks is 256 pixels so 8 by 32 which is uh plenty to be able to identify the location of uh, a source in a room uh very easily and then you can move up closer and take a higher resolution image but we have other masks which are double uh the number of um, apertures um so the image resolution will be twice as much but the trade-off is of course it takes a bit longer to get your image um, and so at some point we made a decision, yes, we're going to go with that size, but yes, you can increase the res image resolution by changing the mask uh, design. And because of the way we've designed the, designed the camera, um, every part is interchangeable with a, another part, which is the same, the same interface. So we have a mask um, with a connector. We can replace that mask with higher resolution, lower resolution if you want a lower resolution mask for some reason, which would make it detect faster. Um, so the answer is yes. You can you can switch out the mask to change the image resolution. You switch out the detector to change the detector energy resolution and count rate, depending on the application. Okay. Um, if there's any other questions, please just pop them through the chat. But one just offhand remark: um, How long did the optical camera last in the 10 cbit per hour uh, it, field? It it, uh, it never died. So um, it's. Uh, um surprising yeah I, well it was, it was it went quite, yeah it went quite pixelated obviously the, the closer it got but that's right yeah you did absolutely well noticed uh it's uh so that was actually just a gopro it wasn't anything fancy and we specifically use a gopro because they're not that expensive and if it did die we didn't really care we'll just get another one um so yes it was only in there for about three hours total um, yeah and um about th yeah, three hours total probably, and didn't die after that amount of time. But as you see, uh, as you notice, there's um, it's actually um, I'll show you something. Well, actually, I'm quite proud of. So yeah, here, this is what the image looks like when you get into the bottom. All the noise from the radiation interacting with your um, detector and your GoPro. But then this photo, you'll notice, doesn't have any um, uh, noise in it. And so <laughs> the way you actually deal with that is you take um, a lot of photos, um, say like 10, 20, and then you do a, a median pixel filter. And it's basically what you do is you go through every pixel and for, of your 10 images, and then you take the middle value and you assume that that's a not a non-noise value. And then you merge all the images together. So basically you take out anything that's identified as noise, you go, okay, chuck that away, use a pixel from a different one. So it's actually a, a blend of, of, this one here is a blend of a lot of different photos to get a non um noisy image so which is all done with a gopro on the end of a stick essentially and so if anyone tries to sell you a you know twenty thousand dollar high radiation camera dose camera uh, don't worry about it just buy 10 gopros excellent um there's one question here can this technology be extended to a 720 degree imaging 720 oh you mean so a full 360 degree, uh, full spherical thing um so yes, theoretically, yes. There's a few sort of, you can, 
you can definitely do it. It's um, so you can have a, a cylindrical mask and then on the top, you could have another mask and another mask under the bottom and they spin around and they'd be different geometries, but you can image, you could image everything. Uh, you could also create some kind of uh, spherical masks, which rotate around inside each other, which are, is possible, but you do come under tricky problems about getting your signal out of a full spherical mask, um, which is, there are possible as like slip ring feed throughs and stuff you can do, but it's, um, I'd say if we ever tried to do that, we'd do just slightly less than a full spherical thing to leave a little hole at the bottom for the detector come, to come up in. But yeah, we can, you can actually use this for any um, field of view, um, theoretically. So you can do it, you could do it, but generally you'd have to be in a very strange situation to want to do that. Um, uh, often there's not things above you. Um, uh, Excellent. Um, I think that's all the questions that have come through. Um, but thank you, Matthew, for the presentation. It's quite interesting. It's great to see how complex it is just to start it out as a as a thought process, um, and then to to see it all the way through. Obviously, from three D printing and finding three D printed tungsten is always going to be interesting. Um, but yeah, no, thank you very much. I, I hope everyone watching has um, enjoyed this this second uh, webinar presentation. Um, and to anyone that is still online, um, if you have any uh, further webinar um, topics or things that you wanna see, please send them through um, to the, via the, the ARPS website um, and we'll, we'll try and incorporate that. We're trying to keep these going as a quarterly, quarterly uh, happening. But thank you again, Matthew. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, it was a great talk and I learned that I never want to have to get into the coding side of what you actually did to develop this. Um, but thank you very much and thank you everyone. Thanks.